Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 99. As usual, I'm joined by Amalith, Mike and Connor. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Ireland just won the Six Nations, Woo. so I'm very happy about that. Yay. In your face, Joe. <laughs> In your face, England. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's always a good day when we beat the English. This week, we're going to talk about some command line stuff. So I'm going to go straight to Amleth first of all. Um, so Amleth, you're going to talk about a blog post you found. The command line is the GUI's future. So tell us about that. Yeah, so Lucas has a blog post called The Command Line is the GUI's Future. And they bring up a very interesting point Microsoft has just unveiled a new UI paradigm in some of their applications. For example, in your email app, you might have a text entry field that allows you to interact with a large language model, like ChatGPT, GPT-4, or whatever. But you can type in that box what you want to happen. For example, send an email to Alex asking them to do something. And that's all you type. And then the large language model comes up with the rest of the email. Maybe they end up replacing the entire UI of Word or something. Just as an example, they probably won't replace the UI of Word. But it's an interesting idea, replacing traditional UI elements with a text entry field where you can interact with a large language model to get things done. Well... It, to me, it's uh, the a logical extension of two things. One is the Earl Grey Hot, where basically the most natural interface to uh, control a computer or anything, a mech- any, any machine, is vo- your voice. And the other one is that if we do that, our offices would be fucking noisy. So um, <laughs> the best thing to do, really, is to type in a command and... Yeah, it is kind of a command line, but it's not your grandfather's ZSH or Bash, right? You don't have to get everything right. The, the, the idea is that you can just specify what you want in your own words, and the machine will be smart enough to make it happen. And not, for example, you ask it to send, uh, send a quarterly report to your boss, and your boss gets all your porn. That's probably, hopefully, not going to happen. <laughs> but it is still, technically, that kind of little... Uh, what you call it, that prompt, that could be called a command line. And uh, yeah, I mean, we already have a little thing when you use, uh, when you use like GNOME, for example, uh, and you hit the uh, super key instead of, instead of uh, trying to select the application that you want to run with your mouse, you can just hit the launcher and start typing and you get the application. So we already have bits of that. You know, you can do the same with you launcher, K runner, uh, spotlight and whatever. So, so we are kind of getting there. It uh, probably would be better if we could talk to f- talk to computers, but we can't because of the noise and uh, privacy and everything. So, typing is fine. When I'm interacting with a Linux computer, I do tend to use the keyboard launchers. I do find they're more efficient. Um, certainly. It's just a matter of getting into the habit of using them, which I don't always do. I do like the GUI shortcuts of your taskbar and having your pinned frequently used programs down towards the bottom. I use that in KD and I use that in Windows quite a bit. Um, So I suppose it's it's just down to your your use case. So for me... uh If you don't use something very often, like if you open Excel and you want to find something that you know is there, but there are so many functions specifically in uh, like Office Suite programs that you can't necessarily find everything as fast as you can. If you just press a button, get a command prompt and just tell the, tell the software, okay, can you insert a pivot table? at this place, summarizing this and this data from this and this place in this spreadsheet, that might be actually much more helpful and accessible to people because otherwise you might spend half an hour trying to figure out how to actually do it. Uh, First, you need to go on YouTube, find out how to insert pivot table. Where is it in the menu? Oh, you've got a different version of Excel. They actually moved it to this place. And now, 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 you know, you have to find out all all the functions. So 
I'd imagine if done properly, and that's a big, huge if, if done properly, this could be so much help to people uh, to, uh, you know, to get the, to, to get computers do what they need to be doing faster because uh, they it is it is really it is really difficult to navigate complex applications with uh, with a lot of functionality if you don't know where things are. You reminded me of the Unity uh, HUD launcher back back in the day. They effectively not all applications supported it, unfortunately, but the idea was sound and this combined with AI that your Mike is describing could be very compelling. Essentially you're like, Oh, how do I apply such and such a filter in GIMP? I have no idea. I'm either going to spend twenty minutes trying to hunt through the menus until I remind myself of where it's deeply buried, or I can just launch up a, a, a keyboard launcher and search for uh, whatever X filter and just type in the name, and then it's like, oh, you want to do this? Yes, and then hit hit return. We we've kind of answered these questions without actually stating the questions, so I want to state them. In Lucas's post, they ask which of the two interfaces would be easier to learn, the text field or all the clicky UI buttons? Which one is more efficient to use? And which of the two would create better results in the vast majority of situations? I think it can't be answered. Uh, so if, if, if what we've described is a case where you know something is there, you just don't know where it is, or you just don't know necessarily how to use it, right? But what if you don't know what a, what a application can do for you, right? If you, if you want discoverability, then the text-based interface is not as efficient. You want the menus, you want to see what it can do, because, you know, if, if you don't know what to look for, then uh, just a chat, uh, chat prompt is not going to help you much. Although there are things like in VS Code, for example, if you press some keyboard shortcut, you get the command palette thing, and you start typing, and it will show you what it can do. Like, it will try to help you with, with the narrowing list of commands uh, as you type. But still, there for exp- for discoverability, you know, you might not be finding anything better than menus. And as well for people who know how to do things, and maybe they do them uh, by root, right? Which uh, I don't think is a great way of using a computer, but many people know that if you click on this and this and this and this and this sequence, the thing that you need to happen every week is going to happen, right? And you will have that report generated for your boss, right? So, so the, it might, it's, it's never, it's never, it's like with anything else in life. It's never too, uh, simple or there is not just one answer. It depends on the people who are going to be using it, but it can be helpful in many cases, I would say. I frequently find myself, and that would be uh, what Mike alluded to there would be one of my biggest criticisms of um, command line only applications is the discoverability of features. Sure, there is the slash help, and then they're like, oh, uh, here are the dozen commands that you can use with this application. I don't, ha- exa- I don't have that list memorized. So if I'm going to go, if I'm, let's say, if it's FFmpeg or something like that, you're doing media transcoding with, and FFmpeg, you could do it like you could have about four or five flags Sure, if you um, if you do something repetitively, the same thing every single time, you could write a script that just inserts that long string of whatever command it is, and you don't have to memorize it. But what if you don't always know what you want to use it for? So you you have it as a starting point, but then the flags you don't exactly have memorized or anything like that. Um, I f- in that instance, I find a GUI program is far easier to learn. I think. FFmpeg in particular is the poster child for natural language interaction. No one knows how to use FFmpeg. If if they do, <laughs> they are employed at one of the big companies making millions off of M- FFmpeg. So I think augmenting interfaces with these like natural language processing inputs is w- will be extremely helpful. But I definitely don't want the UI elements to go away. I don't want there to be no flags for my command line program. Because that that would mean I can't copy-paste commands. I have to copy-paste my prompt and hope it gets it right. Maybe, maybe not. But with with like flags and clicky buttons, we know absolutely for sure 
This is repeatable. It, it will happen every single time. Language, natural language processing and machine learning is a bit non-deterministic. So you can't tell that you, two times is going to do the same thing. If you tell the same thing twice to the same bot, it might not do the same thing because it learned or, you know, something changed somewhere. And uh, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, there could be a, a tutorial kind of thing, right? So you say, like, for example, insert pivot table, make, make it from these columns in this data, uh, use uh, some kind of an aggregating function to show it, show it on the roofs. And it, instead of it actually doing it and in the process fucking up all your data, uh, it could uh, show you like a dry run, basically what it would do. Uh, and it could also save the steps that it does, and you could just have a replay set of routines that you that you figure out. You know, it could be way more interactive because right now you can already do all these things. By the way, you can possibly store a command log of at least in visible data. You can so you can basically store a set of actions and replay them. Uh, and I'm sure it can be done in Excel as well, in Google as, as well, in other applications, not just spreadsheets. I'm just talking about spreadsheets because those are my kind of applications. But if you had this kind of interaction, and I think this is the biggest thing, is the interaction with the machine in a new way, you know, rather than using the machine as a that kind of set of switches, as a console, you know, with, with buttons and menus and so on, suddenly it will talk back to you and maybe suggest things and maybe you can maybe you don't have to know everything exactly as you know right now when you are coding or using the command line I you don't have to you won't have to know everything precisely you can and you instead of knowing how to do stuff you will be able only to get by knowing what you want to happen so instead of knowing that you want to apply a filter in gimp you might just be able to say, well, I would just like it to look uh, black and white or, you know, um, make it even stupid things like make this photo pretty might even get you some results, right? So that, that, that is a, that is a good effort. I, I'm, you know. There, uh, and just as Mike was talking there, uh, there is Qt or sync front end that I was, um, using. I have a, Nextcloud up on a uh, cloud provider. I don't want to give them a free shout out, um, since we're not sponsored. But, um, so essentially it was the the web dev um interface, and I was like, and they're like, oh yeah, you can use OrSync, and it's OrSync is pretty simple, and you just do this. I'm like, yeah, but th- that's not really not intuitive to me. So I um web searched around, and I found a Qt front end for it. And for the life of me, I cannot um, find it just off the top of my head. But uh, if I find it later on, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but essentially, it was precisely what I was looking for. And my understanding of it is that it literally is just a a simple a Qt a GUI, and it just runs the command the commands in the background. That's fine. That doesn't uh, like the functionality I need was it was. There, it just presented all of the options that that I could select, and in simple check boxes, I'm like, "Do you want to uh, verify that the um, the upload has happened or whatever?" And it was like, "Yep, tick, 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 done." And for me, who's a a heavy mouse user, that was way more efficient than than trying to remember all of those permutations and everything like that off the top of my head and trying to feck around on the command line and doing everything like something like literally took me two seconds of a couple of ticks and then done okay um i think we're going to move on to something a little bit less serious um i discovered something on mastodon recently which cracked me up it's the doom scrolling bot on mastodon um it basically reminds you to stop doom scrolling which is amazing uh, because that's something I'm prone to, and it's the reason why I got off traditional social media. Uh, it's it's something I have had a problem with in the past on traditional social media, because I think that the social media just, like, targets that kind of behavior and and really emphasize, emphasizes it. But with uh, 
Mastodon, I find the content to be quite a bit more interesting. So I think I'm a little bit more interested in each particular post because there's more substance and content there. However, it's nice to get a reminder from the doom scrolling bot that <laughs> that you're you're doing it a bit too much, that you're scrolling a little bit too much. And it will give you like nice up- uplifting posts like, uh, hey, are you doom scrolling? Maybe you should go walk in nature for a while. Maybe you should get just get some rest. Maybe you deserve this. <laughs> and it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I know you guys aren't quite as active on Mastodon, or maybe you are. I'm not sure, but yeah, what you know? I I just I, I it's a silly little thing, but I, I just love it. Um, I'm semi active on on. Uh, Mastodon, but probably not as active as you are. So I, I check it occasionally. Anything that would tell me to walk in nature can go fuck itself. To be <laughs> honest, <laughs> it's uh, but nature's the best. I mean, like when we're 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 such computer dudes, and you know, like personally, not so much because you know my as we have discussed, my house is just in an ongoing renovation for the last number of years, but like. I really do feel the need after some computer time to actually just go outside, just look at trees, go 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 to a park, just do something very simple, very relaxing, and um, that doesn't require a lot of mental energy. So uh, I really do need that once in a while. Um, so it's nice to have this doom scrolling bot on Mastodon to remind you to do that once in a while. I mean, this is probably a much bigger discussion about like the impacts of social media and the internet on your mental health and all that kind of thing. But I think it's very important. And I think it's not as like a lot of people tend to doomsay this stuff on the internet, but it's not quite as bad as, as everyone says it is. It's, I think the real danger zone is when someone is on a, a social network where they're spending like several hours a day on it, you know, that, that, that's really not good for you. Like, I, I don't think that's very good for you, but when you're looking at Mastodon, maybe once every two days, like I am, it's fine. But if you, if you do feel the need to kind of scroll a little bit more than you need to, I just find the doom scrolling bot incredibly f- funny and incredibly refreshing. Injury responsibly. <laughs> oh, yeah completely unrelated to that I was not rsync it was our clone and the GUI front end was our clone browser I found it and I've put it in the inner chat so Mike you've been playing with go on data.space uh, so explain to us what is data.space or data.space so data d-e-d-a I've talked about on uh, some previous episode half a year ago or something uh, it's basically one of those free uh, free spaces or places where you can put your code and it will run with some restrictions. And back then it was data.sh. It had a database. It had a, a, like a you know file storage and uh, a runtime for your code. So you wrote something in Python or JavaScript, you put it in there, and it ran. It's like Heroku or, uh, or Fly.io, I think, uh, but for free. Now they had a major upgrade. Uh, they released what they call data.space, and basically they moved it up a notch where you can create your applications. And uh, let's say that I make, a, I don't know, an RSS feed reader, and uh, then you can put it on their platform, and it will uh, it will be available for other users to in- to install on their platform but as their instance. So instead of you having, instead of everybody using the RSS reader with the database that you created, everybody can have their own instance with their own database. So it's basically like an online platform for applications. And it looks rather cool. It's for free still. Mm. I don't exactly know where the money's coming from to pay for all this infrastructure. So God knows. Uh, but uh, they have got so they, they basically started with two runtimes, with JavaScript and uh, uh, Python, 
And now you can very easily do Go applications. And because you you and Amolif both talked about Go on the show, so I thought I'd give it a try because mm. I don't want to make a pun. <laughs> um, I thought I'd give it a try, and I did. And it's an easy, it's a really nice language, actually, to be to be working with. Um, so, yeah, so I, I am working my way through learning Go and the uh you know and and trying out data at the same time and i think there are some really nice possibilities uh for people to uh with minimum or actually no investment in in in, in fact no investment except for time you can just put something quickly together in language uh that, you know choose one of the three languages or you can do it in something other languages as well but uh it's not as easy but, uh, you know, create something for some other people. You can share it in their marketplace or you can keep it private to yourself mm. uh, or invitation only. And it's a really nice way to get into um, making web-based applications. But it's not just Go, is it? Like, I'm looking at the website here. It's not just Go. No. So you uh, you do, uh, you can put in your code. You can make a code that runs on Python or JavaScript or Go, that's what you see in the major documentation. Obviously, frontends are done in, in, in HTML and JavaScript, like any other frontend. Mm. Or you can use, you know, there are combinations. But if you want the backend, um, most people would know, would know Node or uh, Python. Uh, at least, like, most beginner kind of things would probably be in Python or Node, I think, or Go. People probably are able to do Rust as well. I tried, but it wouldn't build. I don't know why. Um, but then I started messing with Go and I stuck to it. So for now, Go is fine. And obviously the front end, because any GUI that you make, that's uh, either going to be normal website or you might be using some framework, like or you might be using something like Tailwind, for example, or you might do um, uh, the thing that uh, Amoli talked about. You might use Geo to compile things into WebAssembly and use that as a web front end. Uh, that's also possible. Sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's like almost like self-hosting as a service. <laughs> You've got your space with your applications that you have installed from there. They call it, I think they call it Discover, but it's akin to like Google Play or the Apple App Store. It's just full of these web apps that other people have created. You can click a button to install it on your space. And then like Mike said, You've got your own copy that has your own data. And because all of that data is stored in their database, D-E-T-A base, <laughs> I, th I think they've got a little pun there. I don't know. But because everything is stored in one database, you can have different applications interact with each other through that database. And I thought that was really interesting. You can, you can like create, generate data from one app and then interact with it from another app, for example. So just as I understand that, that actually sounds really interesting. So you can actually create two or three or whatever separate apps, and they can all act on data from the same database. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. If if you want them to, yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. It It seems like a really interesting platform. I just want to know what the catch is. There has to be one somewhere because it's <laughs> it's too good to be true. What I would like to know is how does this compare to something like Heroku or itch.io or something, you know? Heroku is pay five, at least five euro or five dollars a month these days. There is no, no more any free Heroku tier. So, okay. uh, Heroku, on the other hand, has got more options, right? So you get, uh, you get Java runtime. I think on Heroku, I think you can run like anything you want, really any application. And as long as you pay them for it, um, there is no limit. There is no resource limit on Heroku. Mm -hmm. On, um, I think there is a limit on data that your application must be less than uh, less than two hundred and fifty megabytes in size. So if you are making Go binaries, that's probably all right. But if you, you know, and that is going to be uh, that is that is a res so each of the little pieces of code that you run is called a micro. And your application can have maximum of five different micros. So oh. there is, there are some resource constraint, but as Emily said, it sounds a bit too good to be true. We don't know <laughs> uh, where is the money coming from. You know, they, it's not like 
infrastructure happens on a magic infrastructure tree. So somebody yeah. somebody is paying for it, and they are not charging anybody for anything. I think yeah. they will. They will once they say that they will be ab- enabling monetization for your applications. Like you know, you want to buy something through the app, or you want to b- buy the app. Uh, mm. They say they are gonna it, it, like enable it as a platform. So a bit like uh, Google or Apple are charging on their platform. So I'd imagine they would be taking cut from that. Although there is no evidence for that either, and if, uh, this, this is not happening yet. So I don't. Nobody knows. I did notice, I think, that you can have proprietary applications in the store. Some of them have links to, like, GitHub repos, but I noticed that some of them do not. So that would very much allow people to publish proprietary applications, and then you have to pay in order to install that app into your space. And then, yeah, data would take a cut of that revenue, I assume. But at the moment, compute is free, storage is free, it seems like uptime is pretty fantastic. Mm. I don't know. If you, for example, want to store an object in a database, it's a simple either API call or just HTTP request with a where you send a JSON. It's it's very simple. You know, sometimes uh, obviously platforms can be quite demanding with a uh, uh, high learning curve. This doesn't. Mm. This is this is basically very simplified. So if you are a budding developer, this is the place where you can easily learn the most common concepts. So how would this compare to something like uh, itch.io, uh, which is like a, a, essentially like a marketplace for indie games? I know it's not quite the same thing, but you know, how would this compare uh, in your opinion? As far as I'm aware, itch doesn't provide like web infrastructure to run your app on, while mm-hmm. Data does. Okay. So it is a repository, right? Uh, you basically download the application from the repository and install it on your own PC or whatever you have, right? So you can't actually run it in browser. I think there are some itch apps that do run exclusively client side, and they will host that for you. But that's all client side. There is no back end for that. It's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and whatnot. Okay, so but that's up to the individual app publisher mm-hmm. essentially if there's okay. anything like back end that has to be downloaded you have to run it yourself find someone to run it for you uh, itch doesn't handle any of that mm-hmm. and okay. data is actually actually the opposite where uh, they give you the application database for storing your data they give you the uh, drive kind of thing for uh, for uh, like file storage if you want to store f- uh, like photos for example and they give you the runtime so unless you have actually access to the code uh, on like GitLab or something, you won't be able to download a data application locally and run it. That's that actually like like you said, that sounds too too good to be true. I mean, wh- where do you see the limitation coming in? Like, it's a full platform as a service, and that's not mm. cheap to run. Yeah. I mean, no, no, the, is there any user facing restrictions uh, other than that they're like well, Mike gave an example of photographs I'm like well I have 50 gigs of photographs <laughs> I'm like, I could just go <laughs> boom. they do mention storage limits but it's more like if you start storing too much we're going to contact you and, and say don't store as much but that's that's <laughs> it <laughs> please <laughs> Please don't store too much. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, right now it's uh, it's a popular service among a very niche group of people, right? So there is a Discord server, and that's where the most of the communication happen because it's all probably like Zoomers or whatever, uh, <laughs> and uh, and that's it, right? So you you don't you don't find much information about it. It's run by some company from Germany. Uh, that uh, yeah, so I it's 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 not known. Mm. I do plan to try and build a couple things on data just to see how it works and everything. We'll we'll, we'll see how it goes. They have a kind of philosophy of whatever you know, big uh, corporate or big big project kind of we believe in. You know, where they basically say that. Instead of everybody having cl- what they call public cloud application, when if you use Facebook 
all your data is going to be with everybody else's data on Facebook servers, and it's going to be one Facebook for everybody. They want what they say is a private cloud application, where if you install whatever data app, you have your own instance, and you don't share the data. Now, of course, as far as I understand it, there is nothing preventing the developer to take the data from your application, if they code it that way, and also keep it for themselves. But, uh, you know, there, there is, um, that, that, that that is a different matter. But the point is that you can have applications that are, uh, whilst you don't have to host them and you don't even have to provide a, the platform to run them on, you are. It is your application and you're not sharing it with uh, with somebody else. In theory, you could spin up like a Fediverse instance using Deta, and that would be a true single user instance because you're the only one who has access to it. Yeah, but then you would probably trip up some uh, resource uh, uh, resource limits. Maybe, yes. The The application would have to be tailored to run within Deta's limits. So I think uh, we need to look into this more because I think this is, a, this is an interesting one to look into and yeah. maybe get the maintainer on the podcast at some point because um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. So... We're out of things to talk about. So what I want to say for the last remaining bit of the episode is next episode of Linux Lads will be our 100th episode. So, which is actually quite unbelievable, to be honest. Um, Excluding Connor's recitation of A Night Before Christmas. So yeah, next episode, episode 100. We dropped the seasons and all that. We just went with episode whatever. So we want to hear from you guys because uh, I'm speaking genuinely. I love doing this podcast. I love hanging out with these guys every every two weeks. Um, we have so much fun doing this podcast. Uh, we've been doing what almost five years now. You know, it's just a really good time, and we love doing it, and it's just a lot of fun. And we want to hear from you guys. We want we want you to spam us on Mastodon. We want you to send us an email, show at linuxlas.com, whatever comments or criticisms you have. Doesn't matter. It's all good. Um, not actual not spam. Not actual though. spam. I mean, don't send us like links to porn or whatever, but like, but just like tell us what you like, don't like, you know, just any comments, anything you have, as long as it's constructive, we don't mind. We want to hear from you for the 100th episode. If you send us an audio message and you're okay with it, we will play it on the podcast. But yeah, we're, we just want to get into celebration mode for episode 100 because, as I said, we all really love doing this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, we want to hear from you because um, we really do not hear enough from our listeners and we want to change that. Um, I would like to echo that point of if you're listening to this on the episode and you have never once contacted the episode, you've never once sent us an email, you've never once contacted us on uh, Macedon or Telegram, now is your opportunity. We want to hear from people who listen to our podcast but and enjoy it. Um, so now's your opportunity to give us that feedback or just send us nice messages. So we do this because we enjoy doing it. And I know I can speak for all the other three lads that we all absolutely love doing this. So yeah, we just want to hear some nice words from you guys for our hundredth episode. And, uh, we're going to make it like really fun. You know, Uh, I just want to say from my point of view, I genuinely do I enjoy the any feedback, any interaction I have with the community. That is what drives me. Um, any time that I get to meet people in person is even better. So um, I will endeavor to, whenever they come back, um, go to more in-person um, events and conferences and so on. Because as much as I enjoy reading you guys' feedback, um, get to hanging out with you guys over beer is 10 times better so i will try to do that uh, much more in the future agreed 100 percent agreed because unfortunately connor didn't get to go with us to prague um that was a real shame but like 
Prague, uh, the Ubuntu Summit was a real blast. Anytime we go to Og Camp, the very first time we went, all went to Og Camp as a group. Um, I remember a lot of people were very kind to us. Um, uh, Joe Ressington, like Martin Wimpress, uh, Alan Pope, all, all all those guys. They were just super, super cool with us, and they embraced us as one of their own and all that good, good stuff. So yeah. Coming up to the the hundredth episode, I want to get all sappy and shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just want to give a big thanks to all the people who who were so good to us in the beginning, and uh, all the listeners who have stuck with us for for this length of time. And yeah, yeah, that's that's the end of my sappiness. So you guys introduce a bit of uh, pragmatism. <laughs> The next episode is where we should get sappy and stuff. Yeah, maybe we should not get sappy at all. I mean, it's just humans. So let's uh, let's let's do the technology bit. <laughs> it's just humans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shane is getting drunk and but emotional. <laughs> I am. I am. I really am. But uh, no, I think it is important to say uh, that, like, it is a milestone. We should treat it as such, and we mm-hmm. want to do something kind of special. You know, we want to do something a bit more different than the normal episode. To summarize um, what Shane is saying is, I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, just just uh, just send us some feedback. Otherwise, Shane is really going to cry. And it's gonna be like <laughs> I am. I really am. You know, do you guys really want to be responsible for that? <laughs> me being upset <laughs> do, you really, do you want to be responsible for Maggie Shane cry I think now's the time to wrap it up I think so too yeah, I think we should have we should have ended 20 minutes ago to be honest I pretty much agree ah, you guys man you're raining on my parade anyway okay thanks bye this has been episode 99 of Linux Lads everyone's clapping because it's nearly the end uh <laughs> Are you all right, Amelith? Are you okay? <laughs> Mike, Mike just said, okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's clapping. They, they killed me. <laughs> we should just end it with that. Okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm too drunk. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I can't stop. (laughs) Oh, no. No, 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 no. Okay, Jake, if you put this in, I will kill you. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. At this stage, half of the episode has been Shane asking Jake not to put things in. <laughs> I shouldn't yeah, watch Rugby enough and to drink. Release it as its own I drank episode. too much before we recorded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giddy. Uh, uh, note to note to ourselves: uh, either rugby or podcast, not both. rugby or podcast, not both. <laughs> oh my god! M- more like alcohol or podcast, not both. Oh my god. I mean, a, a couple of beers is not bad, but like, <laughs> I, I didn't even have that many beers. Like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I had like what four pints. Like, it's not that bad. <laughs> Sorry, I got the giggles. Um, <laughs> you know, at this point, I'm like, uh, if you watch the parade and you see all the American marching bands and they have got that permagrin frozen on their faces because they are freezing, they have four kilometers to go and they have to concentrate on this and they have to smile at the same time, there's the same grin. <laughs> anyway, Amalith kind of spurred me on, though, because he started laughing just as much as me. And <laughs> that, that encouraged me. Um, so... This has been episode 99 of Linux Lads. Before we go, go to linuxlads.com forward slash contact. Best way to contact us is show at linuxlads.com. Otherwise, we will see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Goodbye, lads. Goodbye, lads. Okay, thanks. Bye.
Oh no, Jake, be kind to me, please. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, Jake, please, please, for the love of God, do not put that in the episode, please. <laughs>